Hello. Today I wanted to take some time to walk through the process of building this. What this is, is a MIDI keyboard uh, with a grid layout. Um, I built it pretty inexpensively and um, it has some features that I really love about it. And uh, so what I've already done is built a thing. This is my second version. Um, I recorded the process of building and um, after the fact, I'm recording this intro. Um, just to give you a little brief rundown of what it is, it's got 15 columns and 15 rows. And so it's an isomorphic keyboard. It's a MIDI controller and I have my computer playing synth sounds on it. So, um, so each row you can think of as a guitar string sort of. And they're, right now they're tuned one perfect fourth apart, so. Um, you can change that interval if you want. There's um, some functions that I have built into this that, uh, and that's one of them. So you, you can change the rower and interval with this column, and I'll get into that uh, possibly in a separate video. Um, you can change the the distance between the rows. You can create an offset for your right hand that splits down the middle so you can have um, different octaves or different step displacements so that your hands aren't parallel. They're just a little bit like this. I'm sort of thinking of it as like a, you know, left hand, right hand um, division for, for your hands. Um, you can change the sensor um, the maximum pressure that the sensor will care about and the minimum sensor sensor and then you can turn on or off the polyphonic aftertouch and you can also um, offset the octave so um, yeah so let's see we've got uh, half steps going left to right wait let's try to start higher and it's touch sensitive, so so it can detect how hard you're pressing. Um, it's really sensitive. And right now, I don't have anything using the after touch feature, but you can. Uh, each note has its own after touch signal that can be used by some synthesizers to control things like the filter, like how much high frequency there is in the sound. Um, so it can be really expressive. Um, that's the only extra feature it has besides like being a normal grid keyboard. I like how far apart the keys are. So the one hand is playing two octaves. Um, and I like how all the shapes of the chords and scales are um, transferable anywhere on the, on the keyboard. Um, yeah, and so this spans 85 notes if you leave it in this configuration. So three, three keys less than a grand piano or, you know, a full-size piano. That's a low C, lowest C on the piano. That's the highest C on the piano. Um, the white tape is just where all of the C's are. Um, and I, I don't have the tape on every single key, but, um, and then the blue tape is for alternate, uh, blue and green are for alternate tunings. This is for 22 notes per octave, and this is for 19 notes per octave. Uh, I messed around with that in another video that you can go check out if you want, but this is really just supposed to be an intro. So I will walk through the whole process of how I built this. Um, Understanding that this is really, I think of it as sort of a laboratory <laughs> tool, like a, a, something to experiment with and on. Um, so these keys, I've gone through a bunch of different versions of them, trying to get something that feels um, feels useful for my fingers. I don't want to have to look at it all the time, you know. Um, I want to be able to find my place on the keyboard. And so the keys are swappable. They're just stuck on um, 
gently. And there's a lot other of other things that you could add to it. Um, but I'm going to stop talking now and get into the actual build. All right, here we have just a roughly cut and sanded square of wood. Um, and I've got some Velostat here that I'm going to use to make a grid-based instrument. Um, I think this is 11 inches on a side, this square here. So I don't know how long, how big this thing is, but my idea is that I'll just make it flat and it can actually be something that sits on my lap. Um, that's the goal. All right, so I used my square to mark some lines uh, on my board. Uh, right now I'm identifying where the velus that square should live. And uh, be careful what you call a square, because this is not square. Um, it's five millimeters longer this way. So right now, it's sideways. And <laughs> just measure things, is, is I guess my point. Fits great right here, and so that's the idea, is I'll have it pretty close to my lap, and then over here will be room for like the little microcontroller circuit board and maybe some knobs and buttons and stuff. Yeah. It's for me, so it doesn't need to be perfect. I just want it to work. All right. So, uh, in this design, we are going to have 15 row columns and 15 rows. And each of them is going to be... Uh, there we go. 19 centimeters apart. Or 19 millimeters apart. Or three quarters of an inch. Um... And I measured about three quarters of an inch away from the edge of my outline for the Velostat. Um, I just, I'm trying to get all the rows and columns sort of centered in here so that, you know, eventually I'm going to have keys sort of on the edges and I don't want them to be so close to the edge of the conductive film um, that you know, they're less responsive. That was the problem I had with my first prototype. So I'm taking out one row and one column so that they all have a little more room on the edge. Uh, one other tip, by the way, is don't take for granted that the edges of your board are square <laughs> um, or flat or that your, your velus that is square or, f or flat. Um, you know, the, all, all the angles. You've got to kind of measure a lot. Um, Look, I'm getting lucky so far, but like I, I drew my three quarter inch marks here and up here, and I'm just checking every time because I just don't want things to get out of line. Um, that's the biggest challenge. If you're comfortable getting things, you know, within a millimeter of accuracy, should be fine. All right, so I've got all the lines drawn. Um, I gave myself some markings because I'm forgetful. Um, label the top and the bottom of this thing. And where the center of the, you know, the grid is going to be. And um, I also, I went ahead and drew the row and column lines all the way to the end of the board. Um, which I recommend you do too. Because eventually, you're going to have this big piece of plastic here. And while you're trying to, like, line up where all your buttons are going to be, you won't be able to see where you, the columns and rows are. So having some sort of reference outside to line up a rule or two will actually be really helpful. Okay, now I think I'm at the point where I'm going to put some copper tape on here. Um, and I ordered this from Amazon. It's a pack of four rolls of different widths. Um, this is one centimeter or ten millimeters. This is... Uh, hang on. This is for a five and six millimeters width. And what I used last time was this, which is eight millimeters. I think it ended up for, for, you know, the exactness that I was able to make, it was a little too wide. So I'm gonna try uh, 
I think I'm going to try the six millimeter this time. And the reason is that I don't want, so I'm going to, I'm going to lay out all these pieces of tape, um, in rows and columns, and I don't want any bleed to, to get signal to the, to the neighboring rows or columns. It'll make sense a little bit later, but this isolates the, the rows and columns from each other a little bit better, um, electrically. All right, so I've cut a bunch of these out about the same length, and I noticed that I made them a little longer than just the row, because I want to be able to solder to this end. Um, I'm putting the columns on the board, and I'm gonna put the, the rows on the other side of the velostat, so not on the board. They'll be on the other side of the velostat sheet, and um, they'll be attached to like, I don't know, some fabric or some like, some floppy, you know, flexible surface. And what I'm doing is I'm sticking one end down right on the middle of the line, and then, you know, I'm just trying to keep it straight and uh, you know, I don't want any bubbles or wrinkles if I can help it. All right, so now I have put uh, 15 strips of copper tape uh, up and down for the row or for the columns. I always say it backwards, and I got this piece of foam you know, funky foam or whatever it's called. It's foam paper. You can get it at Michael's or any craft store. Some of those are not quite even. Um, those are pretty good, but I think this one over here is a little too close to its neighbor. We want to be as consistent as we can be. Um, maybe this one needs to be moved over like a millimeter. Um, so now the way this is going to work is uh, you make a sandwich. Put my Velostat in here and line it up like so and then I put my rows like this and what I'll do from there is I will solder wires to each of these rows and solder different wires to each of the columns and then I can just fix this down um, and solder all the rows and columns to a circuit that I'll explain more later. Um, and yeah, go from there. All right. So I've got my rows and columns of tape, um, applied. They're on the underside of this and I taped it in place just temporarily so that I could use these lines as guides. Um, to draw guidelines on the outside of this. So now, um, now I can see on this side of my paper where the rows are, even though they're on the other side. Um, and that'll be important when I go to put keys on. Um, I'll draw guidelines going up and down as well, um, so I can line things up right at the intersections. Um, I don't want the keys to be, like, somewhere in the middle. I want them to be as evenly spaced as possible, but also right on the sweet spot where the two uh, copper tapes uh, overlap. All right, just quickly showing that I've put some solder pools on the uh, column uh, copper tapes, and I've soldered some of the wires to them. Um, I'm trying like this is solid core wire. I'm trying to um, make sure that there's stress, st what is it called, strain relief, stress relief on the tape because the tape is not strong. You can rip it real easy and you can also, like the glue isn't super strong. So trying to make sure that these wires will never pull on the, um, the copper tape. And yeah, I found it to be easier to just um, get so a bunch of solder on the copper tape and then I'm just going to sandwich the uh, wire to the pool of solder and then melt the solder. Um, and like this angle here kind of gives me enough downward pressure to hold it in there while the solder solidifies. Um, yeah. And then 
Um, yeah, so I'll do these and then I'll do the rows and then we will have a lot of soldering done. When you're soldering onto um, these, uh, when you're soldering onto anything that's heat sensitive like this foam, you really need to be careful uh, that you don't spend too much time in one spot with your soldering iron. Now you think I got lucky here, but I almost melted through this darn stuff, which would really kind of ruin all of this stuff. You know, the whole thing would have to start over. So take your time. All right, time to take a break. I got all of these soldered, and they are all okay for now. So now what I do is let's flip this over. So this is row one, and now row one. This is the bottom of the whole apparatus here. Row one is down here. Row 15 is the top one. And the idea should be that Row uh, column zero is here, and column fifteen is over here. There's a chance that it, they will end up like in the wrong order, like reversed. Like fifteen is here and zero is there, or something. We can fix that in code if we need to. Not hard at all. All right, now I have all of the columns soldered, so I'm going to use my um, little multimeter, my voltmeter, to check with these probes to see if I have soldered them all in order. If I've soldered any of these out of order, then when I try and start playing with it, it's uh, I will be really annoyed, and it's kind of hard to know right away if you did something wrong like that. Oh, right, so. So is that connected or not? Yep. And then, so if there's a beep, that means there's a connection. So I'm just going down the line. Can you see both? Yeah, you can't really see, but here in the background, I've got my probe on all of the different connections on the multiplexer. And so I'm just going down the line, making sure they're all connected in order. Let's see. All right, I found a problem. These two should not be connected. They should not, oh, see, they should not make that noise because they are not electrically, they shouldn't be electrically connected right now. So it seems like there's a short over on this thingamabob here. Um, it's those last two right there, which I can't really see very well, but I'm gonna have to fix that. But that's why we do those beep tests. Imagine having to take the whole thing apart to get at these little circuits and fire up your soldering iron after you think you're already done. So what we're going to do next is we're going to take another strip of copper tape. We're going to put it up kind of along this edge so it doesn't touch any of these. And... We're going to connect that to ground. So it's going to be our ground wire. Once we've done that, we will take resistors and put one resistor from each of these column tapes to the ground. So they will all be going through a 220 ohm resistor to ground. So we'll do that 15 times. Might have to shorten some of these we don't want any shorts and then i'll probably cover our this with wide masking tape and then i'll cover the um, resistors and the ground with masking tape too um, and that'll be part of the circuit that i will explain later once we've done that then we can start connecting these pins here to the microcontroller All right, just a quick review. Um, so far, we have uh, sanded a squarish piece of plywood, um, and I made it bigger than I needed to, of course. Um, 
sanded it really smooth um, and you want to wipe off any sawdust so that things will stick to the wood um, effectively. Then we um, measured uh, 15 vertical lines that are 19 millimeters apart or uh, sorry, three quarters of an inch apart. Um, got them as um, parallel to each other as possible and as consistent as possible. Used them as guides to apply uh, six millimeter copper tape. Um, you might want eight millimeter if, if you can get it. Um, I tried eight millimeter and I thought it was a little too wide, so this time I'm trying a skinnier one. That stuff's not too expensive though, if you want, if you decide you want to change out for a different kind. Uh, next, I applied some copper tape as rows and I made sure I had some guidelines so that I could stay parallel. You want them to be spaced consistently and parallel to each other. Um, so just give yourself time to do it slowly. Um, the slower you go and the more attention you're paying to like how they're spaced and how they're laid down, um, the better the end product will be. The more consistent the keys will feel. Um, and that's what you want. Okay, so now I just wanted to quick do a quick overview of the next steps and a little bit about how this thing is going to work. Um, this is an information card that came with the, the microcontroller that I recommend using. It's called a Teensy 4.0. You can see some of the details here. Here's the actual part. It's really tiny, um, but it's, it's a microcontroller, which means this is the brain. Um, and if you upload some code to it, which I will provide, uh, then it can read all of these buttons and stuff. So it will do all of the figuring out of what notes are being played, how hard they're being played, and then it will act as a USB device that you can connect to your computer. Um, yeah. So that's a Teensy. You can see it's got a bunch of ports um, which are all labeled really in detail here. The Teensy is a really powerful chip. It's I think this was about $30.00. Um, you can use an Arduino. This is sort of like a fancy Arduino. You can use an Arduino, but I think that it wouldn't perform as well. One of the, the main reason I got this is because, um, I read that it has a really fast, um, analog to digital converter chip, which is what will measure, uh, your, the voltages that are coming through the columns and into so it can measure your your touches faster um and since there are going to be 225 different pads to measure um you want it to be able to do that as fast as possible and so this has a good adc that can do that fast and accurately um it also has a processor that's way too fast for what we need but that's okay um yeah so there's that and then what are, we're going to do next is um we are going to uh, use these two things. These are also, these are not microcontrollers. They are multiplexers. Um, and we will connect those to the Teensy. The Teensy will then interface with the multiplexers and then read one column, or, uh, and then send voltage to one row at a time and then read one column at a time. So these allow you to have, um, you know, a lot of inputs. This has 225 inputs this way. And um, the chip doesn't have 225 little, you know, ports to plug into. So these multiplexers um, let you um, read things in rows and columns. That's a really terrible explanation, but um, hopefully you can understand that this will be connected to your computer. These will be connected to this. These will be connected to one row each, and these will be connected to one column each. And then I'll also set up a way to use a sustain pedal, um, maybe some other controls if we're feeling really fancy, but I, I wanna keep the project um, affordable and approachable uh, so that other people can 
start with it and run with it and do their own things. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit more about the microcontroller and how to connect it. Um, if you bought the Teensy 4.0, um, then um, this should apply directly. Um, if not, then you might need to do a little bit more discovery on your own about how pins work on whichever microcontroller you're using. But here's um, a card that comes with the Teensy. Um, here's the USB port, and here's the actual you know, real McCoy, um, and this is just labeling what you can do with each of these connection points. So pin zero can be a digital, uh, gray is for digital input or output, so a digital input might be a switch or a button, you know, either on or off. Um, a digital output might be, I want to turn on an LED, so output goes to LED or something else that can take a digital signal. An either on or off signal um, and then over on the other side these a pins are analog pins and they can take a range of voltage between 0 and 3.3 volts so we're going to be sending some voltage out through these pins through the velostat and then it'll, it'll come through each of these pins one at a time and it'll measure how much voltage is this one getting it's more complicated because the multiplexers are part of the circuit too but that's the basic idea so analog pins can read a range of values and so they're really cool we are going to use pins 0 1 2 3 and 4 for uh, the row multiplexer we're going to use pin 9 a5 a6 a7 a8 and a9 for the column multiplexers you can see they have the second label here if you want to use them for digital so um, I wrote them down. I wrote all those connection points down here. Um, on the multiplexer, you have pins as well, and they're labeled S0, 1, 2, and 3, and the signal. And they have um, these other pins as well that will be need to be connected. So this, on the TNC microcontroller, connects here. So those are just wires um, connect to each one. Ground, I think that you can just ground the enable pin so that it's always enabled. I'm not sure. Um, I will have to check in on that. And then you send 3.3 volts to the V, that's actually VCC. So that's what we'll do. And the way we'll connect it, well, I happen to have this circuit board already from a past project that I had with a Teensy. Um, and what I did was uh, I just set up some plugs that I'm going to be able to use um, so I'm gonna set it up like that um, and so I will just add these pins to the teensy board then I can plug the teensy board into the inner connections here and those are all hardwired to their neighbors see so um, so then I can plug into pin 0 by so this is going to go to the teensy, and this will go to my wherever I want to send pin zero. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm lucky enough that I have this left over. I'm going to reuse it, save me some soldering. Okay, so I have gone ahead and soldered all of the pins um, into the microcontroller board. I could pull out the microcontroller board if I want, um, if I ever you know fry it or want to use it in a different project. Um, you know these are. 30 bucks so they're not cheap so it's nice to kind of have it um you know in a changeable form and um now the next step is to connect the multiplexers to these and i can plug i, I can use like a female to male connector to plug from those to these um that's what i'm going to try and do next one quick piece of advice I wanted to share is um, if you're using a soldering iron, um, because this part is kind of expensive, you don't want to fry it. I've never had that problem, and I'm kind of clumsy and careless sometimes, so I wouldn't worry too much about it, but um, you, know, you don't want to apply too much heat to the board um, with your soldering iron. It basically means don't keep your soldering iron connected for too long, just long enough to melt the solder. Um, 
what I have done, I, I haven't had that problem where, where I fry the board, but, but I have melted these plastic black connectors because I, you know, because of the heat. So, and that's a real pain in the butt. Like, imagine you have all four, all ten of these pins connected, but one is melted and you can't use it anymore. And you have to undo all of that. So take your time. Um, just go careful. Maybe if you have a dial on your soldering iron, um, don't turn it up too high. Just hot enough to melt the solder. I don't know. Just a point of advice because of the, the cost of this chip. All right. So I've got, I think, everything soldered up. And now I am putting my sheet of Velostat um, right here. You know, as centered as you can. I'm going to tape it with maybe masking tape. Because um, I think masking tape peels off a little more easily than maybe scotch tape. I'm going to tape it in place. And then I'm going to use my multimeter um, to see if there are any shorts between the rows and columns. Um, so I'm going to tape that on. And then I'm going to... Put this down over top of it and line it all up. And then I can start plugging in the multi multiplexers to the microcontroller. Once I get all that done, I will uh, be able to program the, the, the code into it, which will be fun. Quick tip. Um, use tape <laughs> in a way so, so that, you know, you won't short, you won't block... The connection. You don't want to put tape on the Vela stat where, um, you know, there might be a key. I think last time I did this, I probably had tape going all the way across right here, and that probably messed with some of the keys on the top part. Um, you know, the 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 closing the circuit connections. So I'm gonna put tape up on this side and then make real skinny pieces of tape and put them between these copper tapes. Just finished grounding this. Uh, grounding strip um, by connecting it to this pin on the multiplexer. I taped down the sheet here so that it's mostly aligned. I have the Velostat in there too. You can see it right there. I'll cover up this top little strip that's hanging out. Eventually I'll use better adhesive, better sticky stuff for all that. All right, I think I have all of my soldering and connecting done. I think. I think that's coming loose, but I've got these cables that I can unplug if I get at, if I you know got it wrong or something. Going over these are the real cables. They are going to pins zero, one, two, and th three and four, and I have this black one going to ground. And on the columns we have these four pins going to a. Five, six, seven, and eight, and then a nine is going to the signal pin. This right here. So that signal pin is connected to a nine, and then the the row signal pin is connected to uh, five pin five. And then I have three point three volts going to the uh, this red wire and this brown wire. Yeah. So I think I'm ready to plug it in and add some code. All right, here's a quick view of the finished first version of this that I made. Um, I've been trying to improve on, you know, bits and pieces of this right along now, and um, this is what my current version looks like. Um, the unfinished version is right down there, but I'm going to continue with that one in a, in a little bit. So here you can see I've got solder... Uh, connecting these this ribbon of wires. This ribbon goes around to the underside, and there's an, another set of those wires connecting the columns, which are under here. Um, and I have a layer of green foam on the other side of which are my row uh, strips. And then on top of that, I have this white foam to which I stuck all these little squares. So that way, like I'm not messing around with the actual instrument. Like I'm kind of considering the green foam part of the instrument. And then this is just a layer of keys 
that I can peel up and get rid of. Um, I kind of like the idea of keeping it sort of as a, um, you know, a work in progress, like sort of, I can, I can redo this, these anytime I want because it's a really cheap material that's easy to work with. And I'm kind of always wanting to try something that might be better. So, um, yeah, so I bought a, this wooden TV tray at, um, at a thrift store and man, I wish I'd had like a bunch of them because I could do a bunch of projects with something like this. I don't know. It's just really convenient and it's solid and it's got handles and stuff. Anyway, so here's my, um, <laughs> high quality electronics box. And the USB cable is in there. This is connected to my sustain pedal. And it's just a, it's, you know, it's a real sustain pedal. No, nothing fancy about that. And then inside you have um, the microcontroller and then the multiplexers. All right, so now we have keys um, and some markers as well. These white marks are um, just all, all these different colored strips are just washi tape. It's really, um, it's like, I don't know. Uh, mellow masking tape that's really easy to unpeel and, and work with. Um, I'm using the white ones to show where, you know, the C's are on the piano. Um, all the other colored ones are for uh, microtonal music where there's more than note, 12 notes per octave. Um, and I came up with these cool little keys. I just 3D printed them. I'll share the, the model as well. Um, it's it's really just, I don't know, two or three millimeters tall, and it's mostly just got sloped sides. But if you can see, I'll bring it really close, you can see that it's got some ridges. Um, they're supposed to be going like north to south, up and down. And that helps me not only like feel the edge of the key, um, but it also gives me some orientation so that I can feel which way is up and down without looking. And I can also feel if I'm close to the edge of a key. Um, so that's been my my favorite key design that I've tried so far. Um, I don't know. If you don't have access to a 3D printer, you can borrow your public library's 3D printer probably. Or you could get these printed. Or you can use pennies. You could just cut out bits of foam. Um, there are a lot of options. This is, I find this to be the most... Um, most performance friendly um, and most, most consistent. Um, how I stuck these on is not with glue. Uh, I have this little uh, glue dots. These are just basically little squares, uh, not, oh, not squares, uh, circles, sticky circles. Um, it's double sided. There are other versions of this, like there's squares of sticky double sided tape you can buy which worked a little bit better than this because there, it was a little bit more flat. This is a tiny bit squishy, but um, like I said earlier, like I, I'm kind of a fan of not permanent stuff unless you really need it to be. Because um, if you're like me, you're not a professional doing any of this stuff. So you have to accept that you're going to make mistakes and, you know, set yourself up to be able to fix them. Um, oh, yeah. This is the little square of double stick tape that these worked the best, but I ran out, so I grabbed the other stuff. Um, yeah, so I just need to stick a couple more keys on here, and I don't know where they where they went if I just didn't finish what I was doing, but yeah, that's that's all I really have left to do here, um, except for putting on a three, uh, uh, sorry, a quarter inch jack uh, to plug a, a sustain pedal into. Um, I'll need to do that separately. Yeah, so this is this is the instrument. Um, I you bought some thumbtacks. Here you go. This one's not actually in the wood. I bought these upholstery thumbtacks, and I just pounded them in. I grabbed this really cheap faux leather from a craft store. It was like a remnant, and it was on clearance. So I got a lot of it for really cheap. Um, and I just hammered these in at various places around the edges. Um, sort of semi-permanent so that, like, all, all the wires wouldn't be exposed. 
and that's about it.